to you. It's good to see everyone out this morning. Let's all stand. I'm certainly glad to have uh, Sister Nina and uh, Sister Nisha here with us from England all the way. God bless you and make yourself at home. If you've been here more than once, I try not to recognize you. I just assume you're family. So uh, let's sing this uh, song, Who I Am.
We are uh, I'm looking forward to when we have a microphone also for the internet and for the, I know it's kind of strange over singing, you're not hearing them come through, but we're getting it to the internet, so it's coming.
All unspoken, with uplifted hand, I'm going to ask Brother Cody if you would to please lead us in prayer. Yeah, Father, Lord, we come this morning. Thank you for how pleasant you've been on the resurrection and the this weekend, Father. We've come expecting great things this morning. Not necessarily a new message, but just digging deeper into the, the real message, Father. Yes. It has to do with all these spoken requests and all these children and safe attacking and putting them in the hospital, Father. And we know your power is a lot greater than that. Yes. And I know it, Father. All the unspoken requests. Father, we just ask to be with us this morning. Amen. You will turn your book to number 24. <coughs> Living by faith. I care not to say what the
before we go to the word this morning, we just bow our heads to the word of prayer. Dear gracious and almighty God, you, Lord, who have come down to earth and is out with a great shout and message, knowing as Brother Branham said, you came to woo the bride, and believing on this Easter morning, we have assembled here to honor the resurrection of the dead, and knowing that Paul said of the same Spirit, your Spirit, O oh God, that raised up Jesus from the dead, if that same Spirit dwells in us, yes, Lord. it will also quicken, make alive <clears throat> these mortal bodies. So Father, we humbly and reverently ask that you would help us, O oh God, to understand this quickening, this making alive, this injection of your Holy Spirit and the projection of life through it. For we ask it humbly in Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Now this morning, I would like to take for our text from Colossians chapter 3 and read from verse 1. And I'm going to change a few words around if you don't mind this morning. Where the, where the King James uses the word peering, the Greek word is the word phanero, which it means to manifest the one's true character. So I'm going to change a few words around, but it's strictly with the Bible. And he says, if you are risen with Christ, that means if you receive the Holy Spirit, seek those things which are above. That's where focus should be. Where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. Set your affection on those things above, not on the things of the earth. For you have died to yourself. You are dead as a doorknob. And that life is now hidden with Christ in God. For when Christ, who is our life, manifests or express himself in his true identity, then you will also manifest in your true identity, the real you, the person that was ordained before the foundations of the world. Because it is God working in you to will and to do. It is God life manifesting in you and through you, projecting that life to the world. And it is through his glory, his dosa, his values, his opinions, expressing themselves from you, that Christ will be made manifest in his true character, in his true identity, in his many member bride. And this God life in you, manifesting his values, manifesting his opinions, and therefore, for this to happen, he says, kill off those thoughts from you, the person of you which has died, that part of you that used to be focused on the things of the earth, those thoughts which led to fornication, those thoughts which led to the impure thoughts, those thoughts which led to affections which are extreme, those thoughts which were evil, those thoughts, those evil lustings for more and more, in fact, covetousness, which is a lusting for that which you cannot have, and this in itself is idolatry. So Paul is telling us one thing. <clears throat> you died. Therefore, those members of those thoughts that keep bringing forth, as Paul said in Romans 8, he said, or Romans 7, he said, who can deliver me from the body, this body of this death? But I thank God through Jesus Christ who has given me the victory. Now we've read for our text this morning from the book of Colossians, Paul's word of encouragement concerning our new birth in Christ and his life, the same God life that lived itself out in him, now living itself out in you, taking over your minds as it took over his. And notice Paul is talking about appearing, which was translated from the Greek word phantom, which means to manifest in one's true character. In other words, when you come into the glorious liberty of the sons of God, you're not confined to this any longer. You're confined to the real you that was predestined before the foundation of the world. So the scripture speaks of the manifestation of the life, which is the manifestation of the character and the characteristics of the same life that manifested itself in Christ and is now manifesting itself in you. And that is why theology or doctrine alone will never do it. Because theology is man's attempt to explain a Bible truth. But this is more than mere doctrine 
This is more than mere man's attempt to explain it. This is the very life of the source of the life, which is living itself or expressing itself to the world through your vessel. And mere words and mere teaching, mere doctrine can never give you this. It takes a quickening of this life in order to be able to express this life. As the man said to Brother Brown, you sure don't know your Bible, but he said, I know the author of the well. Why? Because the author was living in the Bible in him. <clears throat> John tells us in 1 John 1 1 that that which was from the beginning, that which we've heard, that's one sense, that which we've seen with our eyes, that's another sense, that which we've looked upon in our hand, that's the third sense, have handled the word of life. So here you have an innate object, a, 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 an invisible thing, which is the life, and yet handled, and yet seen and heard. So you're talking about it had to have been expressed, it had to have been manifested to do that. Now notice John is telling us that this is not some mental understanding because all of our senses have come in contact with this life. For the life, he says, was manifested. That means this life he's talking about has openly expressed in a way that our senses have been able to apprehend it. And we have seen it. That means that we have been able to experience this life in an open and manifested way. And, he says, having received this life in this form, we are also able to bear witness to it. Now, what does that mean? It means something has taken place in us that we're able to reflect it. We're able to echo it. We're able to express in terms of words, in terms of emotion, in terms of affection, in terms of passion, the things which we have witnessed. The things that we have seen and heard and, and, and our hands have handled. <clears throat> And show, he says, unto you that same eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. In other words, as Brother Brown said, don't preach me a sermon, live the Lord. In other words, not only have we seen it, but because we believe what we saw and what we heard, we have received it, and thus we now possess that very same life that was with the Father and was manifested in the body of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that which we've seen and heard, declare we, unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The more and more and more you come to know yourself as a son of God, not just a Christian, not just a human being, probably, not just a believer, but the more and more you recognize your family and the role that you have in your family, the more and more you come into a wonderful fellowship with Him and with each other. So John tells us that that which were, that he was a partaker of, that which he heard, that which he saw, that which he received, that same God life that he was now going to declare, which means he's going to utilize words to bring forth what he heard and saw, and in doing so, he will catch the believer and bring with that same word, the same God life that is in that word. And this life will quicken the believer to the life that is within the word. Remember, Jesus said, my words are spirit in their life. And this quickening will bring the hearer to life so that he too can hear, he too can see, and thus project the same God life that was in the Son of God. You notice one thing about the brothers that were around Brother Brown. They not only believed the doctrine, or you know, the message in general, the, the things that Brother Brown taught, but they express it in the way that they talk to each other. You know, they're not, they're not rambunctious, they're not, you know, they're not, they don't put you down, they don't try to roll you over, they, they have that sweet nature that comes with that life. And they, they, they saw that in Mother Brandon. And over time, seeing it and hearing it, hearing it, seeing it and receiving it and believing it, it becomes part of who you are. See? And these things, he says, I write unto you that your joy may be full. That's exactly what Jesus said in John 17. He said, Father, my prayer is that their joy may be full. So we see the importance of hearing and recognizing and then acting upon the word of life. And that is what it is. Doctrine is not the life. But doctrine is simply the teaching about the life. But it is not the life itself. That is the difference between reading a good story and living a good story. Or as Brother Brad said, don't preach me a sermon, let me one. Now in 2 Peter chapter 1, if you'd open your Bibles with me, uh, we're going to begin reading at verse 2. <clears throat> we'll hear Peter saying the very same thing. He says, grace and peace be multiplied 
unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice, how does your grace come? How does your peace come? It's multiplied. What does that mean? How? It's multiplied. How? Through the knowledge of Him. You see, you just got knowledge about Him. That's, that's your doctrine. You're still going to fuss and sue and, and carry on. But when you get to know Him, when you get to know Him, the grace comes, the peace comes. Hallelujah. Now let's skip. Let's not, we're not going to skip through this because there's, there's, there's so many jewels in here. He said the grace and peace are multiplied to us through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ the Lord. Perhaps I can put it this way. Many people know what it's like to be in a place where they've been abused by power-hungry leadership. They <coughs> don't reach out in times of need, but rather seem to be there only when they need your money. But when you, when you are down, and they don't reach out to help you, but rather they use a stick, whatever that stick might be, to keep you down. Now, God said in Jeremiah 12 and 10, Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trod my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate, because no man layeth the heart. Jeremiah 23 and 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock, you have driven them away, you have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord, and I will gather the remnant of the flock out of all the countries which I have driven them, and I will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they lack, saith the Lord. <clears throat> How does peace and grace are multiplied? Getting to know Him. Here he's talking about two shepherds. One that's there to control, to, to manipulate, the other to feed the sheep so they get to a place where he says that they will fear no more. He said, I've not given you the spirit of fear. I've given you a spirit of adoption. I've given you a spirit of love and of good and, and, and of a sound mind. He says, when they come to this, when they come back into this fold, and they begin to eat, and they begin to become what they are. Like Brother Brown said, sheep don't try to produce anything. It just happens. It just, it just comes by its own nature. In Jeremiah 10, 21, he says, For the pastors are, have become brutish, that means kind of bullies, and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Jeremiah 3, 15, And I will give you pastors according to my own heart, who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And so the Apostle Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, verse 3, according as his divine power, and we know that Paul told us in Romans 1, 18, that the power of God is his gospel, which is his good news. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ. For it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It's for the believers. It's the power for the believer. It's the good news. The good news brings the power. Not bad news. Bad news takes away power. And that's what we're trying to get to here. So we, we see he's speaking of the good news of Christ as the power of God to the believer. And now how can you have the power of God with no power? Huh? If the good news is the power of God, right, unto the believer, how can you have the power of God, the good news, without power? You understand how they go hand in hand? How omniscience, which is all-knowing, and omnipotence, which is all-power, go hand in hand? You cannot have a gospel, a good news, without having the power to make it that way, to make it good news. What are the promises of God to you if they're not going to happen? Right? <clears throat> so we see here God is speaking of good news of Christ. The good news of Christ is the power of God to the believer. Now how can you, you have the power of God, the good news, without power? How do the intellectuals bypass that? I can tell you how they deny the power. 
and how the people come to be powerless. Because they make the good news not good news. You say, well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, what exactly does good news mean to you? What is your definition of good news? Would the promise of eternal life be good news to you? I think it would. Would the promise of salvation be good news to you? I think it would. Would the promise of healing be good news to you? Would the promise of never hungry, never thirsty, never perishing, never dwelling in darkness, or receiving remission of your sins be considered good news for you? Would doing the works of Christ be considered good news for you? Well, these are some of the 19 promises to the believer that can be read for ourselves in God's Word. And knowing that God is not a man that he can lie, that if he made those promises, he is here to confirm those promises. Now, would you say the promise to be conformed to the image of the firstborn son is good news? Would you say that the promise to be, become a manifested son of God in this mortal body that you now live in would be considered good news? Would you consider receiving your placement as a son, your adoption of son, would you consider that good news? Sure, we could say that all these promises of God to the believer is good news. Well then, how do the false teachers make the good news not good news? When they say all of those promises are only for one man. It's like the priest who says, well, you know, it's not for you to read the Bible. You, you don't have to do it, I'll do it for you. And so the people sit and they sin, and there's more sin in the Catholic Church. They just find it, well, you can't say they're more, but eventually the Pentecostals have caught up. But when they've got a hierarchy that does your religion for you, as you walk through, does everything for you, you see where that comes? Well, they say all those promises are only for one man. And in this message, they're saying, well, that's for William Brown, but it's not for you. I'd like to share a quote from the brother Gordon sent me the other night. Well, Brother Branham said in a sermon, in fact, I added it to the book. Very good one. From five identifications of the two churches of the living God, <clears throat> Brother after John 14, 12, he gives a teaching what the church should do. Notice, what the church should do. In John the 14th chapter, 12th verse, we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll see that says, John 14, 12, so we read it, make it official. So this is the official version of Brother Branham. And the 12th verse, we'll see what John says. John 14, 12, so we'll make it we need to make it official. All right. John 14 and the 12th verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall you do also. And greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. That's the message of the church. Now, what is the word of? It's an acronym. It means of some. That's your message. Let me read that again. He said, that's the message of the church. Jesus Christ was saying yesterday, today, and forever, living in the church. King of kings, a king of the church, raised from the dead, saying yesterday, today, and forever, <coughs> performing the same works, doing the same things that Jesus did. That's the message of the church. If the church isn't teaching that, it's teaching some false theology. That's what Jesus commanded them to preach. Therefore, who is teaching false theology? It's the one who does not teach John 14, 12 is the message of the church. Therefore, what is the good news? That John 14, 12 is for you. It's not just for one person. Therefore, is being beaten down good news for you? Is sitting under a dark cloud of legalism good news for you? Is being told that you can eat what you can and told you can't eat what you want to eat? Is that good news for you? Is being told to shut your mouth or you'll be hauled off to a room somewhere? Good news for you? Is being told that you're out of line when your conscience objects to being told to do something against your conscience? Is that good news? When you pay your taxes and then they're told that you have no say over your taxes, or the affairs concerning those taxes, is that good news to you? What about when you contribute to a, a work of God and you're told, pay up and shut up? You see, I'm sure these things are not good news to any of us. So why has 
their gospel become those things, and they call it the gospel. And they say to you, you who are standing by your conscience, who are walking hand in hand with the Lord, are being led by the Holy Spirit, they say, you've left the gospel. How is it that you left the good news when the good news is all those wonderful attributes and characteristics that we read, those promises of God? <clears throat> so these men have taken the good news, which brings with it a glorious liberty of the sons of God, and they've turned it into a bondage and darkness. They eat plenty for themselves, but deny you to eat even scraps from their table. The priest tells you that you're not allowed to read your Bible for yourself because he says you will never understand it. They tell you unless you have a fivefold ministry, uh, a minister, you have nothing to say about it. And that, excuse me, unless you are a fivefold minister, you have nothing to say about it. Now listen, these things have not only taken place throughout the history of the church. In every single time there's a move of God, these things have taken place. They're taking place today. But Solomon told us in Ecclesiastes that there is nothing new under the sun. So we turn to the scriptures to identify those spirits that would take good news and make it bad news. And in doing so, they, pre they, they pervert the scripture in doing so. In Ezekiel 34, verse 1, he says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. So it happened back then, too. <coughs> prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherd feed the flocks? You eat the fat, and you clothe, and ye clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The disease have not yet you, you have not strengthened. Neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. They, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek them out. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord, as I live, saith the Lord. Surely because my flock became a prey, my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did, uh, did my shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am, not, I, not, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore, for I will deliver my flock from their, from their mouth, that they may not be the meat for them. But thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As the shepherd seeketh out his flock on the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will deliver them out of the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Remember the cloudy and dark day? What is that in Amos? It's when the prophet comes. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries, and will bring them to their land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers, and all the inhabited, the inhabited place of Israel, I will feed them in a good pasture upon the high mountains of Israel, shall be full, shall, shall their, their full be. There, shall be. there they shall lie down in, good full, uh, in, in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. <clears throat> I will seek them which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between rams and eagles. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures? To have drunken of the, of the deep water, but you have fouled the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet. They drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle, between ye, uh, be, because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder, and pushed all the disease with your horns, till you have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall be no more prey. And I will judge between cattle and cattle, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. 
He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd, and the Lord will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will make them a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them uh, and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the showers to come down in season, and there shall be showers of blessing. And the trees of the field shall, uh, shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be saved in the land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall be afraid of them. And, uh, 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 excuse me, none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall be my uh, be no more consumed with hunger in the land, in the land. Neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord, am their God, and I am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord, and ye, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord. <laughs> all the wrongs that have been done, all the bondage which has been laid out, all the traps, all the snares. He said, they're going away. They will be, will become sheep that are tended for, that are cared for. So we find the Apostle Peter tell us in 2 Peter 1 and 3 that God's word to us is good news. And in that good news, there is power. The very power of God. And he continues in verse 3 and in 4, and he tells us that the power is a transforming power. The power of an endless life, eternal life. And that is what Easter is all about. It's not just coming to church here in the sermon. It's not just coming and dressing up and looking our best and having a nice meal afterwards. But it's knowing the power of his resurrection. Knowing the power that transforms us from weak and cowardly to men who were bold like they were on the day of Pentecost. They were hiding. And when that power came, it gave them boldness to stand in the face of any enemy, of any power, of any authority. Hallelujah. That's what resurrection power is all about. It is not about how well you can live, but it's about your willingness to die to yourself so that the very life of Christ can come in and live it for you. After all, he has proven that he could live the life because he did it, and he wants to do it in your body. And so Peter tells us in verse 3, according as his divine power, that's his gospel, his good news, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and God-likeness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. <clears throat> now that we've gotten through that, I'd like to begin our message this morning. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the God his body. And, you're, and, and you are complete in him which is the head of all principalities and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sin and the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, <coughs> having forgiven you all trespasses, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show to them openly, triumphing over all of them. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of any holiday, or any, any holy day, or any new moon, or of any Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now let's also read quickly Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you have he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And Romans 8 and verse 11. But if the Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his same Spirit that dwells in you. We listened to a wonderful tape of Brother Branham on Friday night in Jacksonville. Brother Brandon was showing how the law can only do one thing to you, and that can bind you. Well, let me just tell you this. 
that just church can bind you. Church can be a very binding thing. But a relationship. And knowing, as Brother Bram said, and, and as I love the words that Martin Luther said, when the devil comes and says to you, he said, you did this. And you did this. He said, don't cower down. Don't hold your head in shame. Look him in the face and say, yes, I did. So what of it? I know that I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. I know that what he did for me, I could never have done for myself. Amen. Brother, sister, we read about shepherds. But the great shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that sets your hearts free. He is the one that feeds you when mere men feed themselves. He is the one that looks out for you. He's the one that tends to all your needs. <coughs> now these scriptures take us to where I would like to begin this morning. And since this is Easter, and we are here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as we open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <coughs> where Paul says, Now with Christ, the priest that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? How say some among us that there is going to be no tent, no resurrection ministry? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified that God, that he raised, not, that, that he raised up Christ, when in fact he didn't raise him up at all. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, then our faith is in vain, and we are still in our sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ, they simply perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now he is Christ. He has risen from the dead. And he has become the first fruit of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. For every man in his own order, but Christ is the first fruit. Afterwards, they that are Christ at his cruising. <clears throat> Jesus promised us believers that those who believe in him, as he promised us in John 11, 25, Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, he, no singular, is it? I don't think so. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So not only did he rise from the dead, but we are promised, though, that though we are dead, or were dead, yet shall we also rise. Now we take it that most Christians are hoping for a resurrection for themselves after they die physically. They do not know when, but they live their life in hope. And Brother Branham said, and I heard it the other day on a tape, he said 95% of all who come through the healing line have hope and not faith. And hope, he said, is the enemy of faith. From faith comes by hearing, Brother Branham said, my, how I, I like to think of faith, hope, and charity, those three things, and hope. What a beautiful little, uh, what a beautiful thing hope is, a little timid hope, lovely and sweet as she is, yet she's the greatest enemy faith has. That's right. The greatest enemy faith's got is hope. Because a person becomes so hopeful till they leave away from faith. Therefore, I'm here this morning to tell you that it is not hope that we have in the resurrection. Not hoping there will be that tent. Not hoping there will be that ministry. Not hoping that we'll receive a body change. But if there's a reality, brother, sister. Because there is a way that we can know whether we will rise from the dead. And that is because we have already risen from the dead. We were dead in trespass and sin, but now it is Christ made alive in our hearts. Now is Christ quickened our mortal bodies. And we will rise because he's already risen. <coughs> and we've already risen. Therefore, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8.24, for we are saved by a hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why would he have hope for it? Now notice here that Paul tells us that if you've seen it, it's no longer hope. 
So hope is what is not yet seen. And faith is not only a substance, but faith is an evidence of things that are not seen. Faith has, has but faith has seen it. That sixth sense has partaken of it. And that's why it's not hope. Now notice the law of life, as we see in Genesis 1.11, teaches us that every seed will bring forth after its kind. Although there is a life in the seed, the life itself is an invisible entity. And yet when that life begins to manifest its nature, its attributes, its characteristics, it must hold to the law of life, which is an observable law related to the natural phenomena. In other words, there are certain attributes and characteristics of every form of life. <laughs> Therefore, what about the God life from the believer? From identifying, identifying himself, Brother Brown said, the pouring out of the Holy Ghost in the last days upon the common people has identified God's characteristics with the people. He promised it. It's the word. He said he'd do it. Nobody can take it back. He said that he would do it. So all these things that he's promised, that's what he does. It identifies his characteristic. Yes, sir. Don't believe it. Don't believe my claim, my, my characteristic. Uh, don't believe my claims if my characteristics aren't that of God. Now notice John 14, 12. Neither believe in me, he said, has my identification. My characteristics. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. That identifies that the character of Christ is in him, displaying the characteristics of him. Amen. Now why do I keep bringing this law of life into this topic of the resurrection of Christ? Because different brands of Christianity will produce different characteristics. So how do you tell the real Christian from the counterfeit Christian? Well, if every seed will produce attributes that will display the nature of that seed, then just watch them. By their fruits, you'll know them. There are many women who wear skirts and long hair, and they're not Christians. And having long hair and long dresses doesn't make you a Christian. But watch their life. See how they act. Watch the way that they live. Watch their actions, the things that they do, the, the works that they perform, the things that they talk about, the music that they listen to. And you'll soon see what life is living in them. From a sermon door, in a door, Brother Brown said, take the life of a sinner out and put the life of Christ in there and it'll bear the fruits of Christ. And again from a sermon, Christ is a mystery, Brother Brown said, <coughs> God is not known by education. He's not known by how to explain it. God is not, but, but God is known by simplicity and the revelation of Jesus Christ in the most illiterate person. See, not your theology, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Upon this rock I'll build my church. No other rocks except no other things except no other Roman rock, no other Protestant rock, no other school, no other nothing. But on exactly the revelation of Christ in a new birth. He's born in there and he injects, he injects, he injects his own life and your life is gone. And the life of Christ is projecting itself through you with the preeminences to the people that they see the very life, that they see the works, that they see the signs and wonders of what he did is doing the same thing through you. Outside of that, the rest of it's not even called to at all. We can call ourselves message believers. We can call ourselves Branhamites. But unless the life that that man lived is living itself out of you. You have no right to call yourself a brand of mine. You have no right to call yourself a Christian. And you might have theology. You might identify with, but is that identification in you, right. expressing itself in you? <clears throat> you know, the Bible says His Spirit will bear witness with your spirit. How does that do? It's because His Spirit will operate through your spirit. His Spirit will manifest itself through you, express itself through you. His spirit will identify. His spirit will express. Notice he said, outside of that, the rest is not even called to at all. The rest of what? Scholarship, education, how well you can break down the doctrine and talk it. Outside of that, that life reflecting his thoughts, his actions, his speech, his works, outside of that, forget it. You see, there are too many who are placing their trust in their own man-made ability to know and to understand the doctrine, to know and understand the word, the message. I've met ministers who can quote you just like that, things Brother Brown said. I've met other ministers who can quote you like that, the Bible. 
And then you look at the way they treat people. And you wonder what kind of a spirit they have. Yet the Apostle Paul said, and though I have the gift of preaching to the point where I not only understand all the mysteries and possess all knowledge and can make it so plain in my preaching, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and yet not have the love of God in my heart for his children, I'm as good as nothing in God's eyes. Didn't Brother Brown say, if you love me, treat my kids right? What do you think God says? What do you think John said? How can you love God of whom you cannot see? He said, I'll show you how. He said, love his children. Mm -hmm. Brother Branham said in a sermon, Sir, we will see Jesus. He said, we Christian believers should reflect his life. So much till it would be his entire representation. We should be that. Every Christian should represent and reflect the life of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? And I believe that every Christian should be reflecting the life of Christ. He said in St. John 14, 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And then we know that that's true, that we are his represent representatives, and we claim that Christ lives in us. And if Christ does live in us, then we should do as Christ did. We should reflect his life. Mm -hmm. And from a sermon of the rapture, Brother Rath said, that how do we get into this body, 1 Corinthians 12? By one spirit we're all baptized into this body, by one Holy Spirit baptism, and if you want to put that down, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and by one Spirit we are all baptized. And the Spirit is the life of Christ. Is that right? The life of Christ. And the life of any seed, which he was the word seed, brings the seed to life. You get it? If that life is laying in the seed and his bap this baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon it, it it's bound to bring that seed to life. Notice, your Brother Ryan says, the, the life of any seed will bring forth the same seed life. <clears throat> the same seed life. And from Paul, Locust, and Caterpillar, Brother Brown said, and if Christ is in that vine, and the, and the life of Christ is in that person, it'll be like Jesus. It'll bear the fruits of him. It, it's his spirit. It can't do nothing else but do it. It's got to produce that life, because it's the same life. You just can't produce anything else. It'll act like him. It'll talk like him. It'll walk like him. And it'll heal like him. It'll see visions like him. It'll produce exactly his life. Perfectly every time because it's his life. You're just a shell. I like that. Now I'm getting back to what Brother Bram said concerning hope and faith. What do you think he meant when he said hope is the greatest enemy of faith? Well, hope is always looking out there somewhere while faith looks at what is inside. Why don't you think about that? Hope is always looking out to grasp. Faith has already attained it's the evidence. It's the substance of things. Hope. From the third Exodus, Brother Brown says, of faith, its resting place is in the sanctuary of God's word. When faith, genuine faith, sets itself there, not make believe faith now, faith, not hope, but faith. Hope's out there hoping it was, it was in. Faith is already in. Looking out and saying it's done. That's faith. There's where faith takes its resting place. For it knows that God will never, never let the enemy ride over the top of him. He never has. Faith knows that. So regardless of what the thing looks like, you see, you've already got it inside. From Sirs, we would say, Jesus, he said, now look, my own faith in God will take it away from you, but it won't stay unless you have the same faith. Faith. See, don't just come with a real reverence just, and, just don't, and just be normal. Just be normal and say, God, you promised it, and I'm your child. Now watch. So you can see what I mean. 90% of the people, sister, 99 and 9 tenths that come, they say, oh, I got faith. But they have hope instead of faith. Faith is positive. I guess I was wrong when I said 95%. It's 99.9%. He said, 99.9 tenths that come say, oh, I got faith. But they have hope instead of faith. Faith. Is positive. Faith says, My father is looking out for my best interest. And I believe he's my father. I know he's my father because I have his life living in me. I have his attributes. I have the characteristics. There's no denying. <clears throat> I can look at some of you with your children out there, and there's no denying they're your children. They look like you, they talk like you, they act like you, they walk like you. And brother and sister, we are. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, word of his word, spirit of his spirit. 
Now look, hope is an earnest expectation. The dictionary says hope is to wish for something with expectation of its fulfillment. To look forward to with confidence or expectation. But notice that all, it's always out there somewhere in the future beyond your grasp, whereas faith is an evidence. Faith is a substance. In other words, it's a reality. It's not a, hope so, it's not a, a future hope so. It is not a wish for. It is something that you have already in possession of now. It is the evidence that is already there. That is what... It is an evidence that the price has already been paid for. You buy a token to get on the bus. You take that token, you get the token. It's not money, but it's, it's a token. It's, it's something you, you can take to the bus driver and say, you buy a token, he says you can get on the bus. Yeah, that's your faith. You know it because you see it in here. It's already moving. It's already changing. We're already moving from image to image. From glory to glory. From opinion to opinion. From values to values. He which began the work in you is also here to finish that work in you. Amen. All we have to do is just let go and let God. Now remember, Brother Brown said, it's not your ability or your education, it's not what you reason yourself into, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ in a new birth. Notice the revelation in a new birth. You see? He's, he is born in there. Who is born in there? Christ is born in you. And when he is born in you, he injects his own life. Notice he injects his own life. He injects like, like being inoculated. When you're inoculated, you receive a germ to, pre to, to prevent you from getting the germs. Right? And we receive the inoculation of the Holy Ghost. He inoculates you. You get that germ of life into your body, expecting that that germ of life will make you immune from the things of this world. Hallelujah. Well, Brother Brown tells us that Revelation inoculates you and injects the very life of Christ into you. And when that happens, he says, then your life is gone. And the life of Christ is projecting itself through you. With the preeminences to the people. What does that mean? <clears throat> when they can see in your life that Christ is a complete preeminence of your thoughts, your actions, your talk, the way you are lived, that's Christ projecting himself through you. Notice again. He says, your life is gone and the life of Christ is projecting itself through you with the preeminences to the people. Notice your life is hid in Christ with God. And his life begins to grow. And as it grows, it begins to project itself forth for everyone to see these attributes and characteristics, these new attributes, new characteristics that now are alive in you by his birth in you. Then he says, when the world sees this new life, this life has been injected in you and you are now projecting that life that they see the very life, the very works, the very signs and wonders that he did is doing the same thing through you. Outside of that, the rest of it's not even called at all. Now notice the same life, just in another vessel, but living the same life, expressing the same actions, the same speech, the same works. I hope that you can see why the resurrection is so important to us and why the promise of John 14, 12 is so very important. Because it shows those who are born again with the very life of Christ in them and John 14 is a projection of that life in the believer, showing it is the same life by the same works, the same actions, the same words. It's the same character. <coughs> and if you have the same characteristics, you have the same character. From the stature of the perfect man, Brother Brown said, and then when we can get so transformed by his power that we die to our own thinking and our faith becomes a genuine faith, hallelujah, then, when? When we die to our own thinking. Then he says, and only then will the life of Christ, that the life of Christ is transfused into us. We become living creatures of God, a dwelling place where the Holy Spirit can send his, his radiant blessings down through there, and we're in the statue of Christ. And if the statue of Christ, then we are conformed to the image of the firstborn son. Now listen, if you don't think William Rattle was not conformed to the image of the firstborn son, you've missed the whole appearing of Christ. Appear means to make known, make visible. So if Christ has appeared, then how did he appear if you cannot see him? 
He appeared in his prophet, lived in his prophet, spoke through his prophet, acted out his life through his prophet, and did the works of Christ through his prophet. And if you die to yourself, he will do the same thing through you. That's what John 14, 12 is all about. Not just greater words, but words, actions, a life lived. Not just for one man, but for whosoever believes. Amen. From Christ is the mystery of God revealed, brother, I said, look, Christ in you makes him the center of the life of the revelation. See, Christ's life in you makes him the center of the revelation. Christ in the Bible makes the Bible the complete revelation of Christ, but Christ in you makes you the complete revelation of the whole thing. See what God's trying to do? When I can look up, like Paul said, and I see nothing but Jesus Christ to be crucified. And Christ becomes the center of the church. He becomes the center of the fellowship. He becomes the center of the believers. You see why it's so important to die to your own thoughts so that you can, you can see the doctrine of Christ? You see why it was not only being able to believe and talk the doctrine, but to lay in the presence of the Son to write them. So that you can see that relationship that he had with his Father and the Father with him, and not only see that relationship, but to see him as a pattern for every seed. He was the example, see, the very life expressed. And to know that as you as a son have entered into that same relationship, the very same life that God passed down into his son, in his fullness, and set free from that vessel, that it might enter into all vessels of God, of his children, so that we might become sons in the very image and stature of the firstborn son, as Paul says in Romans, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And what does it mean, unity of the faith, or revelation? Well, the word unity means the, stat, the, the state or quality of being. And didn't Jesus pray in John 17 that we would all be one with God? Then if we're one with God, when they see you, they see Christ. Remember Brother Brown said, when you see me, you're looking at me, aren't you? Well, I'm looking at you. And more and more, brothers and sisters, I'm seeing Christ alive. I'm seeing Christ crucified. I and mean, you crucified. And Christ is living. Through his very life, released into our vessels through the same revelation that we have now. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. One is through the knowledge, the gnosko, which is the experiential knowledge of the Son of God. That word gnosko is not just a knowledge as though something that we can obtain in the head, but it's an experience that we go through, which we receive through a relationship with Christ. Hallelujah. From a sermon, Abraham and his seed after him, Brother Brown said, raised, up, uh, uh, raised him up on the third day and raised up his body and brought it up to glory. And there sent the Holy Spirit back and kept the body on his right hand, sent the Spirit back to live in the church, to make, to make a church just so much with the life of Christ that in the resurrection the two will come together, bride and bridegroom, the church of Christ will be exactly alike with the same kind of ministry, same kind of power, same kind of spirit. He raised up the body of Jesus Christ and sat on his right, uh, on his right side, <coughs> his right hand, and poured down the Spirit upon the church on the day of Pentecost. That's how God proved his covenant with his people. Same ministry, same power, same kind of spirit, he said. In Genesis 1.11, the law of life, every seed after his kind, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And Brother Brown said in planting the vine, the word of planting, he said, it is the spirit of the living God that changes your nature. What else could produce Christ's life in you? It's God life, the very same God life that raised up Jesus from the dead, is also what quickens your mortal body. This God, that, this, this body that you're living in now, that's your substance, that's your evidence. You, can, you can't see it, feel it, smell it, hear it. Yet it is the very life of Christ, God's own life living in you. And you know it because you know what life that you once had, and you know what life that you now have. Like the woman said, I, 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 I ain't what I'm supposed to be yet, but I, I know I ain't what I used to be. There's a change. What an evidence. Not hope, not a, not a hope so, but a reality, a substance, a real evidence is the very life itself. It's the only evidence. Now, not what you can quote. Not what you can pretend to know. Not who you know. Or how high you can get promoted in the church. It's the very life of Christ living in you by the new birth. And you either know that you have it or you don't. And no pretending will ever make it real. 
Or you might pretend to be what you're not, and others might be fooled for it for a little while, like Abraham Lincoln said. He said, you can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6 and 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he only deceives himself. And the Apostle John said in 1 John 1 and 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive only ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Why is it that people sometimes they they get into these modes, they get into these things where it's, well, like John says, if you think you have no sin, you deceive only yourself. Just ask your wife, she'll tell you. Huh? Who knows you better than your spouse? They'll tell you when you're carnal. They, they know when you're not reflecting Christ. So it all comes down to what life is being projected from our vessel. <clears throat> from identifying masterpieces of God, he said, what we need today is the life of Christ inside of us. That's what purifies. Not the outward, a turned around collar, or a degree, or psychology, or something. It takes the power of the resurrected Christ to make us what we should be. God has no other plan than to, than to let the Holy Spirit rule and reign in the church. From identifying Christ of all ages, he said, it takes death to yourself to develop the picture of the image of Christ. I love this quote. The life of Christ in you. It takes death to yourself to develop the picture of the image of Christ. The life of Christ in you. You have to dump your own out so that Christ can come in. You have to die to yourself. The Apostle Paul didn't have a great ministry because he was more intellectual than anyone else. He said in 1 Corinthians 2 and 1, Remember, friends, that when I came to you to let you in on God's masterpiece, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and latest theology. I deliberately kept it plain and simple, wanting you to know, wanting to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In other words, Paul wanted to show them the character and the life of Christ and the need for death to self to have this life. And he goes on, I was, I was unsure of how to go about this and I felt totally inadequate. I was scared to death if you want to know the truth about it. So nothing I said could have impressed you in any other way. But the message come, came through anyway. God's Spirit and God's power did it, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not to some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anyone else. Brother Bram said in Christ is a Mystery, he said in Paul, this great intellectual man, he never tried to impress, to express his great terms upon the people. He humbly accepted the word of the Lord and he lived the word so that it expressed it. He lived so, so godly until you seen Jesus Christ in him so much till they wanted his handkerchief to take it and lay it upon the sick and there is the life of Christ. And in closing from investments, Brother Brown said, that's no way to get, uh, to get the outsider, the person who's not a believer, he's an outsider. And if he says you want to catch that person in the net for Christ, this is the way to do it. He said, live the life and let Christ live in you. That makes him hunger and thirst to be like you. And you become salty, you'll get thirsty. The only way that you can be salty is let the life of Christ be in you, <coughs> for he is that. Salt only saves as it makes contact. And that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 2. <clears throat> okay, Brother Brown said from here, he said, if the new life that you think that you've received doesn't pattern with God's word, then you've got the wrong life in you. The life of Christ will produce the works of Christ. It will produce the faith of Christ. It will make you act, up to, like, like, act as Christ. It will make you love him. He will be first in your life. Your objectives, your motives, and everything will be altogether different. It will be for the glory of God. And now if we really want to know what it, uh, what it takes to make us true believers, Brother Random tells us in the spoken words of original seed, he said, all right, manifested, the works manifested the same by us, for it is the same word. Now if you want to do the works of Christ, do the same thing he did. He that believes on me shall have my works. What is that? Believe is what? That he is the original seed germ that come. <laughs> Here it is, brother and sister. Recognize that you have received His Spirit. Recognize His Spirit will act like the original seed. And then step into it. That's it. Step into being a Christian. Don't be hung up, hung up by your past. Don't be hung up by 
the, the, the things of this world, or the, the, you know, somebody has an attitude. That's their problem. You know, we have people that have not come to maturity. They get offended so easy. Why would you get offended by anybody, what anybody says? It doesn't make a hell of beans what anybody says. It's what he says. You understand? Notice we have gone full circle this morning, seeing the resurrection of life has got to come from the firstborn son into sons. The same seed life in the original seed will be in other seeds with the same life in them. From influence, Brother Ryan said, and if the life of Christ has been transferred into you by the Holy Spirit, you will bear the fruits, you will live the life. From it wasn't so from the beginning, he said, you say, well, we'll just live loose. Well, he said, that shows your name isn't on the book. So these people that go out and they have a drink with their social, you know, with their meals, says so shows your name isn't on the book. Brother Branham, he was our example. He said we have a Nazarite call, brother sister. We have stained from alcohol. We have stained from smoking. We have stained from those things. He said you drink the social drink. You go out and have your little drink. He says right here. He says it shows your name isn't on the book. That's exactly that proves that you wasn't when you when you try to live that kind of a life and you want to live. That shows you haven't got it. They say, well, Brother Brad did the work, so we can just relax in that. I'm sorry, but he'll go in, you won't. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have the life of Christ, you won't do the works of Christ. If, if you're a real Christian, you'll live the real life. Because the life in Christ is in you, and you can do nothing else but live the life of Christ. <coughs> Look, brother, sister, I studied Brother Branham's life as much as I could. I found from different brothers as much as I could to where Brother Branham, even before, you know, the Catholic, he would not, he would fast, you know, uh, before communion. And, uh, and, and then he'd go out and party afterwards. Listen, too much of that going on. Brother Branham himself, after he took those elements, he fasted until the next morning. Mm -hmm. He didn't go out and socialize, he didn't go out and party it up. There's been too much of that in, in Grace Fellowship, too much of that in Grace Gospel. That's not the way Brother Branham acted. He went home. He reverently soaked in that glorious, precious moment. He didn't make it a social thing. Notice that if you're a real Christian, you'll live the life of Christ. You won't have to work at it. It'll be just as natural as though he's living in you and doing it for you because that's what he is. Paul said, it's not me living, but Christ is living in me. From Israel at the Red Sea, he said, if a man is born in the Spirit of God, it's automatically he lives a life. And if the Holy Spirit's on the inside, it produces the life of Christ. Amen. That's faith. Amen. That's right. From true line and false line, he said, the life that was in Christ has to be in every branch. And if Christ's life in him was preaching the kingdom of God and healing the sick, every branch will have the same substance in it. As it comes up, it can't be nothing else. The life of Christ in you. From is your life worthy of the gospel, brother? I said a Christian is to be Christ-like, and Christian cannot be a Christian until Christ comes into the man, the life of Christ in him. Then it produces the life that Christ lived, and you do the things that Christ did. What am I talking about? A personal relationship to Christ. What is it? It's your is your life worthy of the gospel? Well, that's what Easter is all about. It's His life coming back to live again in us. <coughs> From conference, it says if you're not born again then you're not a Christian. You can only be a Christian when, when you take the life of Christ in you. If the life of Christ is in you, it'll produce the life of Christ. And from conference, he said, we, we could scream and shout and do whatever we want to. It'll never influence man until they see the life of Christ being projected in you. Someone who's tender, someone who's merciful, someone forgiving, and ready to turn the other side of the cheek, or give the second coat, or go the second mile. Christianity in action. Not just talk from the pulpit, but acted among the members, among the pastors. That's when you see Christ living in the church and decisions made. And from countdown, he said, now, he said, he that believes on me the works that I do shall he do also. He cannot change that decision. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If the life of Christ is in you, if the mind of Christ, then we're concerned and we do the things of Christ. He said, these signs uh, that he done will follow every believer that believes in him. <clears throat> that comes right down to the youngest of the young. Now we have a need this morning. We have two people, Brother Hickerson, Brother Hick. I am visiting with Brother Don. He's in a very bad way. Uh, his, his arms are all just as blue and black as just 
almost looks like tattoos. It just the whole arm is just solid black and blue from the uh, you know the program he's going through for his health. He's looked like Brother Bill a, a few days before he passed away. We want to pray for him this morning. And we want to pray for little Adelaide. She's a, a, a dear child and, and uh, the devil is working on on her little body to uh, try to interrupt the family. So we just want to take our moment this morning. This is Easter. Easter is resurrection. Resurrection is the highest form of healing. We want to pray for that little girl this morning, for Brother Hick, that God will truly, completely do a work of Christ in the midst of the body of Christ. And we're coming because we have hundreds and hundreds of scriptures and quotes where Brother Brad said those things are in the church. Now do we believe it? Or are we just hoping? I believe it, brothers and sisters. So let's bow our heads in prayer. The gracious Father, we come before you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we come, you said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And whatsoever you would ask the Father in my name, I will do. And so we're asking you, Father, to, to hold to your word this morning, knowing that you're not a man that you could lie. And we're asking you, Father, to manifest your word, to put skin on your word this morning. Yes. And so, Lord, we pray for little Adelaide, that you would come forth into her room, and that you would hear her by the power of the resurrection. And we ask, Father, that you would go to Brother Hick, and that you would bring forth his body in a way, O oh God, that would just Raise him, Father, as you said, that if the Spirit of Jesus Christ be in you, it will quicken your mortal body. Yes, Lord. And so, Father, we ask that you would quicken, make alive again that mortal body in Jesus' precious name. Now, Father, these are not my words, these are yours. We are not coming with a hope, so, Father, we're coming because we believe that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe that you're not a respecter of persons, that every single Christian, every single believer in here, is entitled to ask, and you shall do it. You shall perform it. There's nothing we can perform. We're hundreds of miles away. And in, 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 in Adelaide's case, we're at least dozens and dozens of miles away. <coughs> but Father, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the omniscient one. You are the all-powerful one. And by the stripes of your Son, Jesus Christ, they're already healed. Now we pray, Father, you would manifest your word for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And the Lord bless thee and keep thee. And the Lord shed his light upon thee.